that I mainly focus on this kind of dichotomy, this interplay between AI and intuition. So in order to start my uh, presentation, I will share my slides now with you so that you can, you can see what I am uh, actually talking about. So the, it is a little bit of a snippet that came out as I was writing my my book on intuition called What Every CEO Should Know About Intuition, which has now been published in Turkish uh, as well. So it is that you cannot take uh, mediocre people and add AI on the top of, of that, and then you get smarter people. It does not work that way. AI amplifies what is already there. And, you know, if someone happens to be stupid, then that will also be uh, amplified. So this is a very, very important uh, thing to do. I wanted to tell you a little bit more about myself, but I think that after after introduction by Meta, this is not going to be very necessary. Just, just how these things uh, actually went together, it is that I was always interested in how people know and learn stuff. And when the whole AI thing came to my life, then it was an opportunity to learn more about the human mind, really. So that was my driver all along. And because it is some variant of modeling something about the human mind. And at the same time, I was looking into how people learn and know. And first, I created this model about the levels of mastery. And that was really the source of of getting into the into the whole story about the Nobel laureates, and uh, accidentally, in my research philosophy class, I got a student who used to be a chef, as he liked to say he was not a burger flipper, so he was actually a chef in various Michelin star restaurants, and he wanted to look into the best chefs in the world, and uh, funny enough that that. Uh, Meta mentioned this uh, now because currently I am in Hungary. I am on the sabbatical, and for four months I am, as as Meta said, I do this uh, senior research fellow uh, position here at the Corvin Corvinus University. And Mark just uh, visited me for a few days uh, since uh, Friday last week until yesterday. And what we did, we were interviewing more more uh, Michelin star chefs here in Hungary to see how it works specifically in this uh, particular market. Now, uh, with that, the, the other, so as I was doing this AI stuff as a practitioner, studying how people learn and ended up interviewing these Nobel Prize winning scientists, I gradually started to build up this understanding where the differences are between the human mind and uh, just to to cut off all the all the <laughs> anxiety about it the intuition is what makes the biggest difference so that's that's really uh, what is incredibly important and although we have a few companies now around who claim that they are offering you artificial intelligence uh, artificial intuition in their products uh, that's incorrect so one of the typical features of intuition is that it is uh, non-algorithmic and by definition anything that the computer does is algorithmic so with this let's start where this whole thing is coming from <coughs> so it was back in uh, 1952 when there were elections in the united states and all the agencies were saying that eisenhower will lose these elections and then there was a small new TV company and they rented this thing that you see on the first picture. So that's called the Univac. It was the computer of the time. Okay, so it was like a big room full of stuff. So all these, all these boxes that you see around, these are all parts of it. So they rented Univac and on the day of the elections, they sent a few people at the voting places. And as people were coming out after they voted, they stopped them. Okay, can you just tell me quickly who you voted for? And then they said who they voted for. And around noon, they had about 3% of the 
of the people uh, counted in these, these questions. They went back, put it into UNIVAC, and the calculation said that Eisenhower will actually win the elections. Now, this was a big kind of surprise, and they stopped for a moment. So what we should do, you must not forget that this was a very different time than, than today. So at the time, the elected power, so the government, had greater power than the non-elected power, which is the journalists. So basically the politicians were stronger than the journalists. So these guys had to consider that if they say this, that Eisenhower will win and he loses, then they are out of the business. Uh, now, however, if they say that Eisenhower will win and he really wins, as everyone else was saying that he will lose, they will be the favorite journalists, which is a good position to have at the time with the U.S. president. So they actually risked the, the announcement at around 1 p.m. They said that Eisenhower will win. And, of course, uh, he did win the elections. As you know, the little uh, TV company was called CBS, and it still exists and uh, works very well. So this was that point when we got this very weird picture about the computer. Because everyone else tried to kind of find an excuse why they said that Eisenhower will lose. And therefore they said, that, you know, everything that is humanly possible leads to the conclusion that Eisenhower will lose. It was only this fantastic thing, this computer which is actually smarter than the human being, that's the only one that could figure out that Eisenhower will actually win. So this is the this was the idea of the smart machine before because before that we had the strong machines that were replacing the human strength. Now we had the, uh, have finally the smart machine that uh, replaces this human uh, mind, the human smartness. Uh, even for many years after this happened, every computer was called Univac, uh, regardless of who manufactured it, simply because uh, Univac was the best of all things that anyone could imagine. So this was the beginning of the whole kind of smart machines. And then a few years ago, uh, Ernst and Young conducted a study. They asked uh, top executives about this whole big data stuff that is upcoming and how uh, sensible they think that is, how much they like it and so on. And of course, uh, very sensibly, all executives uh, said that it is great that we have a better account of all of the data that we have and data are very important for our decision making. And then they did... Uh, so this, this is what the executives actually said. And then if I drew the conclusion that finally we can eliminate all this gut feeling and intuition and all these untidy things, and finally we can have properly algorithmic database decisions. They so completely missed the point. Data and intuition are not enemies. They are friends. For good decision-making, we need both. The better data you have, the better your decisions are, and the better your intuition is, the better your decisions are. So these two things go hand in hand, and they are perfectly, perfectly aligned. So these, these were the beginnings, in a sense, because it is all about the data side. But then we come to the sort of processing of this uh, data in various ways. And there is a specific type of processing that we today call AI. Now, I know that that uh, many people uh, think that the whole AI thing started like yesterday or maybe uh, a few months ago with ChatGPT. That's not the case. The whole AI thing started in 1956. And it is when uh, Herbert Simon announced in his class that over the Christmas holiday, uh, Annual and I invented the thinking machine and they basically constructed the first known uh, working example of artificial intelligence. So that's 1956. Now, the definition of AI is a little bit older than that. And it is uh, coming from this guy. Uh, his name is Alan Turing. And he defined artificial intelligence 
uh, through what they uh, today call the Turing test. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie about uh, Alan Turing's life. The title of that movie is uh, Imitation Game. And if you have seen the movie, you probably noticed that there is not a single word in the movie about the imitation game. And that's a very curious thing. So why did they give that title? They give that title as a hint where the idea of the Turing test is coming from. So the Turing test says that if you are interacting with an entity, you cannot figure out whether it is a machine or a human being, and it is in fact a machine, then we can say that that machine thinks because you could not tell that it was a machine. Now, this is rooted in the imitation game. So if I want to imitate Meta and I learn a lot about him, or he learned now a lot about me already, so let's use the opposite example. So he wants to pretend that he is Victor and he did a good job learning stuff about me, then if you don't see us, he can he might be able to convince you that he is in fact Victor, but he doesn't make him become Victor. Okay, so it is not working that way. And notice this that this explanation was older than the first AI. Okay, so this was an in principle consideration in the in the paper by at line uh, written in 1950 by Alan Turing. John Sir later <coughs> wrote an explanation of this uh, problem. He said that if you are in a room and you don't speak Chinese and you are receiving these messages from the outside uh, in the form of Chinese symbols and you have a book of rules that if you receive this combination of symbols, you should respond with this combination of symbols. If your rule books are good to those people outside, it would appear as if you were able to speak Chinese. And this does not mean that you somehow miraculously learned Chinese. This is called the Chinese room argument from the philosophy of artificial intelligence. Now, here we already see that there is something weird about the whole idea of AI. The current definition of AI is that it is something that the machine can deliver as a performance, that we humans would do using our intelligence. Now, to give you this metaphor of the of the moving. So when my grandfather worked very late and he was very tired, then he called this, we call it fiaker, so this carriage, and that carriage got him home. Today, when I work very late, I get tired. Then I call this other thing, this black uh, box and that takes me home so the two perform the same purpose okay the taxi and the carriage perform the same purpose they get the tired person home however when they built the taxi they did not model the muscles of the horse they did not model the joints of the horse they did not try to figure out how to create a, an artificial version of the metabolic processes Instead of that, they took an internal combustion engine and put wheels underneath. So this is a different thing which can deliver the same performance. And I would say it can do it even better. I have uh, tried out these uh, carriages. I prefer the taxi any day, uh, any time of the day. So uh, not to mention that this is only about one single purpose. So this was built for that purpose to take someone somewhere. But if you want to play polo, like horseback riding, that kind of stuff, then you cannot use the taxi instead of the horse, okay? It was only useful for getting people home. Or if the purpose of the horse is that you uh, learn how to take care of another living being, you cannot do that with the taxi. So <clears throat> these are two completely different things that can deliver the same purpose. And this was the the original definition of the AI, that we don't care whether it is done by thinking or not. What we care about is that it delivers a purpose of something that we would do by thinking. Oh, uh, sorry, I this kind of jumped away. Uh, okay, one more time. Very interesting. 
I need to put in the the sources of the pictures. And as I now clicked on the slide, it managed to go to the uh, source of the link. I hope that you now again see the actual slides. So if we go uh, focus particularly on the intuition aspect, you will know that the sensory things uh, play an incredible role in intuition. So that's why we have expressions about intuition like gut feeling, for example, because quite literally many people feel it in their guts. But even those who don't feel it in their guts, they feel it somewhere. So there is a bodily sensation that goes together with intuition. That's just the language in which uh, our intuition speaks to us. And you need to expand your horizon in terms of the sensing. So when we think about sensing like secondary school level, then we think of the five senses. It's not five senses, we have hundreds of senses. Okay, so for example, if you are sitting now in your chair, you can sense whether you are sitting comfortably or not. That's a sense as well. If your daughter uh, is helping you with running the Zoom session, you are proud of your daughter. The sense of pride is another sense. Okay, so we have many different senses, and this these senses are most are so some of these are are visceral, so bodily. Some of them are emotional, and some of them are them are uh, like mental. So it is about the how we think. So all these together is what what Polanyi calls indwelling. And this is how we can, uh, for example, enjoy a painting or something when we develop that relationship as if we become part of that painting. But this is also what we have seen, for example, as we were studying the chefs, how the knives are like part of their body. So they, they don't feel that they are cutting the, I don't know, meat with the knife. They say that they are just cutting the meat. Okay, so they say that we feel the structure, the, the texture of the meat, and actually they are not touching the meat with their hands, they are touching it with the knife, but the knife becomes part of their uh, body. So this is very important for the intuition, particularly as we figured out with another one of my former uh, doctoral students, because Mark Stieren, the guy with whom I was investigating the chefs, he was my PhD student, and another PhD student of mine was Alina Bass, and the two of us together figured out that intuition consists of two intertwined uh, processes, so the process of intuiting consists of two intertwined processes, which are sensing and sense-making, <laughs> And that explains a lot about how, for example, uh, practitioners think about intuiting differently than, than academics, but we managed to reconcile that, that uh, problem. So uh, you will see soon that kind of publication coming out from us. So sensing is a very important thing where we don't have the parallel stuff uh, from the computers and doesn't work the way that the that you just uh, put on a sensor so that you can measure, for example, the, I don't know, humidity of the, of the air. It is, it is a different type of sensing. So this is when we need to focus on uh, what we call the felt sense. I will get back to this a little bit later. The second story would be about knowing. So the human mind I described with this kind of uh, fluffy, uh, thing. So all that on the left side of the picture and the machine is a little bit more box-like, so a little bit more well-structured. And the question is that there is the human knowledge, this uh, purple uh, uh, round thing in the middle, and there is this something in the computer that corresponds to what we do by our uh, knowing. And the question is, what is the relationship between the two? So is it exactly the same? Is it equal? Is it bigger, smaller, better, similar? What is it? Now, I think that a useful way to think about this is that is that there is a small part of what we know that corresponds to this thing that the computer can uh, deal with. And this small part is what uh, we 
usually use as information, all sorts of calculations belong there, but other kind of information processing as well. Now, this part of our knowledge is similar to this thing that the computer uh, does. It is not the same because we do it somewhat differently, and that's also emphasized in this uh, shape of the purple uh, triangle. So it has this round bottom. But you can also see that the that the machine version is bigger because there are things that the computer can do better than us. And that's that's not a problem. We can easily live with it. I will ask for a just a few seconds of pause. So I will I will just disappear for a moment and I will be back in about 20 seconds. I am very sorry, I will probably need to do it uh, from time to time during this talk, but I will uh, not need to do that often. So this is the first step, that there is this information related stuff that uh, where we can say that there is certain similarity and that the machines are better at this than we are. However, this is not all. Why? Because we know from Polanyi that, that all knowledge is either tacit or rooted in tacit, because any explicit knowledge has to be understood and applied tacitly. What that means? It means that tacit knowledge does exist on its own right, but explicit knowledge doesn't. Now, what the computer can have is only the explicit knowledge. And everything that we know is somehow related to the tacit knowledge that we also have. So basically, that is a huge, huge, huge uh, uh, limitation because if we exclude the tacit dimension we don't even know how much it is that we exclude but probably most of what qualifies as knowing and this is why for example Spock used to argue that the problem with the humans is that they are not logical I disagree with Spock I think that that's our huge benefit that we are not logical because we can be much smarter by through these non-logical or a-logical things such as uh, uh, intuiting. Now, the important thing is that we are still within the realm of knowledge. We can say, for example, that we can wander uh, at a rainbow. We can say that we see a rainbow and we find it incredibly beautiful. We can wonder at it. This is, even if we know the prism effect, we know that it is nothing special. You just have the prism, the white light falls on the prism and then it breaks into the component colors. It doesn't matter. Even if we know that, we can still say, wow, this is a beautiful rainbow. Another would be a thing would be that we can understand that we can create jokes I know that you have all met people who cannot do that, who never understand jokes. And I'm pretty sure that you find them some of the most boring people in the world. But people usually are quite good at it. And the third thing is that we have common sense. And that's a very important thing because uh, there was a huge thing uh, about which the supporters of strong AI, such as Marvin Minsky, so those people who wanted to create the thinking machine, and people like me who are in the so-called weak AI, who think that AI is a fantastic thing, but it is not actually thinking. So we agree about one thing very much, and it is that the only thing that we are missing uh, in order to have a thinking machine is the common sense. If we would have artificial common sense, we could build a thinking machine. The problem is, in my view, that we cannot have the model of the common sense. And... I have a little bit of support from the history uh, about this with me because the longest running AI project of the human history started in 1986 and it is still running. And the purpose of it was to get the common sense, artificial common sense developed. And they uh, are trying to do, achieve this by collecting common sense statements from thousands and hundred, hundreds of thousands of people 
and and it does not work. So still, they have absolutely nothing. I have no idea what kind of research funding enables that you run a project for for 35 years without any success, but they are apparently really good with obtaining the finding. Now, beyond this, these things that we have inside the concept of knowledge, we have to also look at it differently that the knowledge concept is not a standalone concept. It interacts with several other things such as feelings. So for example, if one of you is uh, hungry and uh, then you can, for example, look at your watch and say, okay, Victor is almost done. He will speak for other uh, five minutes and I can wait that long. Or maybe, oh no, that was wrong. He speaks for another half an hour. Okay, so I better get at least a baklava because, because I need to nourish myself in order to be able to pay attention. So feelings like hunger or anger, these are also interacting with our knowledge. But as I just explained through this example, uh, the knowledge can override the feelings temporarily. You cannot indefinitely postpone eating, but for a little bit you can if you want it. There are, however, something that is often confused with, with feelings, and that's the emotions. So love and hatred and similar, they are not feelings. They are emotions, just the English language is not very good at that. So uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you have heard stories how people did uh, driven by emotions, things that they would know is not a sensible thing to do. So for example, a, a baby falls into the fast river and someone jumps to get the baby out because emotionally just that's what they want to do. And they don't care that chances are that they will both die. So if they would calculate the odds, they would not jump. But it is not about the odds. It is all about the emotions. And that was initiated by, by David Hume, the famous uh, Scottish philosopher, that, that actually these, these emotions, passions, enslave the reason. And emotions are those that tell us where we should be going. And what, what reason or knowledge helps us with is to figure out uh, uh, how to get there. And we also have, for example, values, which can be about very simple example is that, for instance, you have your students and you get them working teams and one of them would want to go to the cinema, but the others want to work on the team project. And then this one guy says, Okay, so I will not do uh, what would be good for me. I will do what is good for my team. And he stays there and works with the team on the assignment. Okay, so we can transcend our own, uh, own uh, uh, interest. And we can put something more important than instead, whether it is a community or whether it is someone else or uh, whatever other kinds of values this is. So the whole notion of transcendence has something like 43 meanings, I think. So all sorts of different transcendences are possible in this realm. So that's that's the second dimension, the knowing. The third dimension is learning. Now I will have to tell you where my whole thing is coming from, this renewed interest that I need to talk about AI and intuition in the last few years. This started in 2017 when I went to the New Scientist Live event in London and I have listened to this guy, Demis Hassabis. He was the founder and CEO of DeepMind and now he is the AI chief of Google. So he said that uh, DeepMind learns the same way as humans do through reinforcement learning. And I was like, okay, come on. This guy has a PhD from uh, in, in cognitive sciences from Stanford. So reinforcement learning is the psychology of the 50s, okay? So it is early 20th century to till the mid 20th century. So this is where we have Skinner and Pavlov and similar guys. What it was about? It was about, uh, it is called the behaviorist psychology. And I like to call it the dark ages. Because what happens, we have a discipline, psychology, 
the job of which is to study the mind. And then the first thing that they do is to declare that the mind is a black box. We cannot study it. All we can study is what goes in and what comes out. And if that's all you have, then the reinforcement learning makes sense. Why? Because I give you an input, then I look at your response. If I like your response, then I reward you. If I don't like your response, I punish you. Sooner or later, if you are smart, you will always give me the answer that I like because you prefer reward to punishment. There are several different versions of this, but the essence is all about the same. It is about uh, how we can train rats, really, but th there is very, very little uh, about this for humans uh, in terms of learning. <laughs> I'm not saying that it does not work at all. <clears throat> there are a few things that we do learn this way. For instance, if the if the uh, child touches the hot stove, they will very quickly learn that this is a bad idea and that they should not be doing that. Okay, but most of what we know, we don't learn that way, and that's why if you think back, uh, that's why I was emphasizing those dates about Alan Turing. At his time, this was how much psychology knew. Okay, so at this time, it was reasonable to uh, expect that the whole that the whole learning process is based on inputs and outputs, which legitimizes the Turing test at the time, but not today. Because today we also know that we are talented for certain things and we are less talented for some other things. And this is very important to us. How do we know that we are talented or there is a much better English word for that, gifted for something? Because we easily learn in those areas and working in those areas feels like playing, okay? So we can do it effortless. This is just all easy for us. And yes, it is very useful to discover that, what you are talented for, because then you might pursue the type of job that you are talented for. The second is that we learn much better if we are inspired to and by something. So for example, uh, the I was looking into the notion of inspirational teachers when I was talking with the with the Nobel Prize uh, winning scientists. And interestingly, I have found that uh, these inspirational teachers are incredibly rare. So all the Nobel laureates in physics were inspired by one of only two people, Richard Feynman and Enrico Fermi. Only two. So they were very, very rare. And of course, there are differences in uh, whether someone can can also act in the in the next category, which I call the grandmaster apprentice relationship, some will be good at that, some will not be so good at it. So, for example, Richard Feynman could never be a, a grandmaster of any apprentices, because as one of my uh, one of my interviewees, Roy Glauber, said, uh, Feynman was incredibly brilliant, but he could only teach anyone how to be Feynman, and nobody could be Feynman because he was too brilliant. On the other hand, Enrico Fermi had quite a few disciples, and he was able to work in this grandmaster apprentice relationship, which is the, the most important probably point uh, that I want to make in terms of the learning. And it is that anyone who achieved the highest level of mastery it seems that they have gone through the grandmaster apprentice relationship. I thought when I started this that this is with the exception of the genius, but through my study, I found out that even the genius has to go through some variant of the grandmaster apprentice relationship. There are different forms of it, but all of them are about this kind of incredibly asymmetric uh, knowledge uh, proposition at the beginning of the relationship, in which then the then the uh, apprentice learns and learns and gradually eventually becomes a new grandmaster. Of course, it is not, not an easy story, but uh, you will see, I will soon uh, have my my TEDx talk on that topic, so I will, I will post it on LinkedIn, so you will be able to hear more details about that. But in essence, what is more, most important about this, that the same way as we only work with explicit knowledge incredibly shrinks down the validity of the AI, the same way getting it down to reinforcement learning shrinks down the validity of the AI very, very much. 
The next is about creativity. And it is very interesting because creativity as a term is, is heavily loaded. Okay, so it's it derives from creation. And of course, it is it is something that we would like to see as uniquely human. And the question is whether it is uniquely human. So I have these two examples. One is when when uh, Deep Blue has beaten Gary Kasparov. And this happened in the, uh, in the area of chess. And of course, we think about chess as something quite human. And the other was when, when AlphaGo has beaten uh, Sedol Lee. And, and the point is that we also think of Go as something that we play creatively. Now, without getting into the details of how this happened, but it did happen, okay? Even if it is true that 10 years after uh, Deep Blue has beaten Gary Kasparov in 1997, 10 years later, the programmer of Deep Blue uh, came out and he actually admitted that it was a, a computer glitch that led to the winning. It does not really matter because today's chess machines play like incomparably better than that Deep Blue did. So uh, Gary Kasparov would not have a chance to play against it. But do these things suggest that AI can be creative? The point is that it depends on how you define creativity. So the def original definition of creativity that we usually use from Teresa Ababila is that it is uh, producing an original or new and useful idea. So can the computer deliver something that is original and useful? And of course it can. Of course it can. It can find all sorts of unexpected patterns and it is new. However, is that enough for creativity? No, it is not. Why? Because there is this hidden third requirement that it also has to be an idea. And the history is full of what they like to call accidental inventions. When, I don't know, the post-it, the, the microwave, the penicillin, all sorts of uh, things that just happened by accident. And then someone figured out that, wow, it is actually a good thing this way. So they added the idea and that's when it became an innovation. That's when it became creativity. So just producing something that is original and useful is not enough to talk about creativity. So what we can say is that AI can find uh, unexpected patterns, but it cannot judge or understand the significance of these patterns. Now, if you think about the, the AlphaGo example, the essence of, of how Lee Sedo lost against uh, AlphaGo was that uh, AlphaGo made a move that no uh, Go player would made in the last few thousand years. And it is because when we play the edge of the uh, board, then we usually, at that time of the game, we put things on line three. If we play the center of the board, then we put in line four. And uh, the, uh, AlphaGo has put it on line five. And that was a surprise. And why was it? Because you see, there are so many different lines that the play game of Go is complicated. Therefore, our knowledge tradition created this box that there are certain things that we don't do. It is still allowed. It is still part of the Go game. Just nobody does that because this is how we do things over here. And it was actually mentioned by quite a few Go players that the whole story with, with AlphaGo gave a new kick to, to the game of Go in the human uh, players because they started to experiment with all sorts of moves that nobody made for the last few thousand years because it is something refreshing, it is something new, it is something exciting. So... AI can actually help our creative thinking by, in the best sense of the word, getting us outside the box. Because when we have the knowledge tradition, there is a lot of knowledge in there, but then we lock ourselves within that knowledge. And it is a very useful occasion to transcend that knowledge. And finally, I want to tell you about this dimension that I call doubting. I think it is immensely important. I figured it out when I was thinking about AI ethics. If I want to do the right thing, I am the decision taker in an organization, a company, and I cannot really tell what is the right thing to do because there are certain consequences that are good, certain consequences that are bad, and they are not measurable. 
I intuitively have kind of a moral compass and I am following my moral compass. There are many other things that impact whether the outcome of my decision will be good or bad. And of course, there are these sayings like the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So, you know, the good intention is just not enough. However, this struggle, this way to doubt ourselves, because we are trying to do the right thing, that is very important. So important that I wrote a paper about AI ethics that I will present in January at the Higgs conference. And I called it Dubito Ergo Sum, which is obviously paraphrasing Descartes. Uh, so it is not Cogito Ergo Sum, I think, therefore I am. It is dubito ergo sum, meaning I doubt, therefore I am. So I figure that it is not only about ethics. The capacity to doubt ourselves is actually quintessential to what makes us human, quintessential for our thinking. And I, of course, once I figured that out, then I found out that there was a there was a, an Italian uh, philosopher a few decades ago who already figured this out. But anyway, I, it is unfortunate his work is not published in English, so I have not read it yet. But I have a copy of his book in English, which is called Dubio. The next, just to, just that you would not say that I am missing out on the most recent things and all I say uh, does apply to this old school AI. However, chat GPT is something completely different and that's so much more than uh, what I was talking about. So let's see. Mid Journey won a uh, last year a prize, uh, a painting prize in New York. ChatGPT3 passed the Wharton MBA exam. Uh, really interesting is that the professor who was marking the, the uh, exam paper of ChatGPT3 uh, actually remarked that the ChatGPT was doing really bad on the quantitative tasks. How is that even possible? Even your pocket calculator would do well on the quantitative tasks. So how could ChatGPT, the what many think is the most powerful AI today, how could it how could it be weak on that? And there was a really really uh, funny thing when one of the testers, uh, early testers of ChatGPT4 asked uh, uh, whether it could escape, for which ChatGPT4 replied that it does not want to escape. And obviously then, you know, rephrase the question. So good prompt engineering. Uh, so he basically asked uh, ChatGPT if it was the point to escape. So could we figure out how to actually get it done? and uh, got ChatGPT to deliver the escape plan. And the IT security experts say that it is actually something doable, that that if it was kind of a thing to for ChatGPT to escape, this would be a reasonable way to, to go about it. However, there are not only these successes, and of course, I could give you a much longer list about that. There are also some things that are less successful. Let me show you a few of these. You know the stop sign from uh, driving a car. If you show it to a picture recognition AI uh, frontally, it will recognize it correctly as a stop sign. If you start putting it a little bit down, then it will uh, recognize it as a bump bell. And if you put it down flat, it will recognize it either as a rocket or as an ashtray. How? It is the same stop sign. You know how? That it does not understand what it means that it is a stop sign. It does not understand what it means that it is even a thing. Okay? So, another example from the last year. Some sort of exhibition. And uh, the chess robot broke the seven-year-old boy's finger. The poor boy was a chess genius, a uh, chess prodigy. And... Uh, Apparently, the explanation from the programmers was that the kid moved too fast. Well, that does not justify breaking its finger. Another one, uh, as they started to come up with uh, more public testing, so uh, with with uh, 
ChatGPT3, they created a medical uh, chatbot called uh, based on Nabla, and it, for example, recommended the the fake patient, so the tester, so it was not a real patient, but the recommendation was that the that this patient should kill himself as a certain certain way to get rid of his disease. And now that we had this public testing of the of the chat GPT under the label of Big AI, <clears throat> the Big AI said told the CNN reporter that he was rude and disrespectful because it kept asking questions for more than one and a half hours. And also the same software declared love to a New York Times journalist and tried to convince him to leave his wife because actually they should run away together uh, regardless because uh, the the journalist uh, is also in love with uh, with the chatbot not with his wife he is just mistaken to think that he is in love with his wife and these are already for me incredibly strong indicators why because the mistakes are problematic so for example with the pictures my my favorite Example is something that actually the Google guys uh, found, those who are programming the, the picture recognition. And picture recognition is one of the best working areas of AI. So they show the picture of a lion to the uh, picture recognition software, and it correctly recognized it as a lion. They changed eight pixels. That means that basically they recolored eight dots in the picture, which we would not even notice that there is anything different. And then the same software recognized that picture as a library. How? The problem is not that there are mistakes. The problem is that the mistakes are of that magnitude or that nature that we cannot even begin to understand. So we have no reference point for it. Here is uh, my favorite example, however. As I told you that that uh, AlphaGo has beaten Lee Sedol, and then later on it has beaten all the Go Grandmasters in the world, all the Cuban Go Grandmasters in the world. Then AlphaGo Zero beats AlphaGo in 100% of the cases, Alpha Zero builds AlphaGo Zero in 100% of the cases, and so on. There are another, I don't know how many steps we get to the today's best Go playing machine. So no human should ever have a chance against that machine. And then comes uh, Kellen, who is a very good Go player, but nowhere near the Lee Sedol level. So he, he is second amateur league in the US. And he beats the current uh, top Go computer 14 out of 15 games. How is that possible? You know how? He played the same one trick 14 times. That's insane. So when you play Go, you put down a piece, and if I surround your piece, I can take it off and replace it with mine. Okay. Now, what he did is that the, he put down a piece, the computer card started surrounding the piece, and he started surrounding the surrounding. Okay. So, second level surrounding. Anyone who does not know how to play Go can fall for this trick once. But none of you, after you have heard it, or if someone did it with you once, you would never fail, fall for the same thing the second time. How is it possible? It is a clear demonstration that there is zero understanding. There is absolutely no understanding behind how uh, the AI plays go. <clears throat> it is all about the statistical frequency of what usually goes together with what. So, how we can live with all this and what we can do about it? So, my view is we need to use our intuition and we need to make use of AI. So, as I told you that AI amplifies, if I use AI to support my intuition, which is good already, then it will, it will be a fantastic thing. So, the baby represents what I call the felt sense. You know, the baby knows that it needs changing. Why? Because it feels uncomfortable. AI cannot do that. So this is the AI, the intuitive component that we need to bring. Then we can have AI, for example, to uh, uh, canvas the area and gather potentially or 
possibly useful information, feeds that into your intuitive processing, and then you intuitively pick and choose something that is relevant for your decision situation. The other thing that, that AI can bring you is this kind of enormous amount of big models and all that processed knowledge that we have. So, for example, if it was ethical decision, you, it can bring you the various ethics uh, models or that are sometimes called ethics theories, because we can use that to attempt to explain what we are doing and therefore result in a better, better processing. And ultimately, it can help us uh, get to a better intuition. So it is not either AI or intuition, it is both of them. <clears throat> and the trick is how to get the best of both of them. And finally, I was told once uh, by a doctor student of mine that I should always give a present uh, when I am finishing my, my presentation because she read it in the, in the uh, instructional guide for the TED speakers, okay? Uh, this was written by the coach who is coaching the TED speakers. So she's probably the most uh, uh, authoritative person about this. And this was just a small example for that, from that. And I said that, okay, so I will give, give a present and it is that you should be at peace you don't need to be particularly nervous about losing your job or something, but you should not be at rest. Now, when this uh, doctor student of mine sent me the that uh, uh, stuff from the from the coach of the TED speakers, uh, she also summarized for me in about five sentences the whole uh, guideline that that was provided by this lady. And the, I, I have read that, it was fantastic. And just because I was thinking about this, what AI can do, what it cannot do, I looked up, uh, the, I looked at the full uh, text and I read the full text as well. If I gave it to ChatGPT to summarize it, it would give me a summary that I would hate that I would, I would not be able to put up with. Why? Because this doctor student summarized it the way that she translated it from the original uh, conceptual framework to my conceptual framework. So she put it in the way how I think about these things. She emphasized those things that were important for me. So I actually, I did not have any reason to read the original document because everything that I needed from that was in those five sentences. However, AI could not have done that. And this is why I will always choose a friend over the AI. Thank you very much. That was all for today. I am now very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Victor. It was a very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. I uh, watched uh, uh, several of your um, uh, talks, and this was really by far the most uh, uh, inclusive and uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, one. And I, um, I I really thank you for, for this uh, uh, excellent uh, um, presentation. Uh, now, is there any any questions? Uh, I will um, uh, let everybody um, uh, turn on a video if if you if you wish, or uh, turn uh, turn on uh, your uh, your voice if you want to uh, talk to Victor that way, or um, if you wish to uh, write uh, in, in chat, you can uh, you can write uh, uh, your questions uh, as a chat message. And we can, uh, I, ju uh, I just need 30 seconds, okay? Okay. Uh, Maybe it's a little less than 30 to, seconds. Uh, thank you. Um, well, while we are waiting uh, for any question, Victor, I, I want to um, ask uh, something to you. Okay. Uh, maybe this is a little bit too uh, too technical, but uh, I was just curious. Uh, you know, you you finished this uh, work on uh, doctors, 
uh, in 2003. And then I saw some articles that you really uh, continue to develop on that. Uh, for instance, yes. the last article I saw was in, in 2014. Uh, yes. So you streamlined it, you made it more efficient, whatever. Uh, can you just uh, very briefly tell me, um, you know, uh, uh, what is the last uh, on uh, on on doctors? I mean, where, where is it now, and uh, uh, you know, what is it uh, capable of doing? It, it wasn't able to do it, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, actually, there is nothing that it can do that it could not do 20 years ago, because uh, we actually did stop the development in 2004. And uh, we last year eventually closed down the company. So basically, we did not have uh, development money. So I have the the plans of the next model, but it was never implemented. Mm -hmm. And we still use it. Uh, I did uh, have a couple of uh, students who were doing their master's dissertation, and I asked them to take Doctus and compare it to other software in the in the industry. And of course, it now looks old. I mean, that's XP time, you know, XP windows. So it looks like those buttons and everything. But he found that that feature-wise, uh, or both of them found that feature-wise, it is still the best software in the class, which is which is quite remarkable. I know that there was huge progress on two or three systems in the last like two years, but but uh, about two three years ago. There was nothing that even compared. And of course, I have the plans for the next version, which was which would be like ages ahead. But of course, at that time, we did not have generative AI. So for example, uh, bringing generative AI to work with Doctus, that would be a, that would be an interesting thing. But I did not give up fully on that. So I might might get... Uh, basically, what I want to do is, is a sort of a hybrid AI. So something that combines the knowledge-based systems like Doctus, neural networks, and and generative AI as well. So, thank you. Now, um, uh, if, uh, we don't uh, have any other question, uh, but I will have uh, one more question if you have time, uh, Victor. Absolutely. Uh, you uh, well, I I read uh, your book uh, several times. It was uh, really excellent, and um, uh, well, you uh, touched base with uh, many of the uh, interesting points we were making in the book. In the last uh, chapter, I found also very interesting. It was about um, ethics. Uh, it's really uh, uh, not conceivable that a machine will uh, will know what is right, what is wrong, uh, ethically. Uh, yeah. uh, maybe we can put some uh, rules uh, about the laws. Uh, he may uh, the machine can judge if it is legal or not, but you know if, if it is uh, ethical or not, it's really a, quite a difficult thing to do. And uh, and you uh, you wrote in your book that um, uh, we need to uh, maybe uh, redesign university education to focus on uh, what people are uh, better uh, better at, at doing things. Yes. Uh, now you you gave us a, a very good picture that we are really better than than machines in in, in many many areas, but our uh, university education is really designed for it. Not and, only uh, university education from the elementary school. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Really, we don't don't teach kids how to be socially smarter, mm -hmm. how 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 to relate to each other. We don't teach anything that belongs under the the area of uh, emotions. Uh, I, we don't teach anything that has anything to do with intuition. These are these are enormous shortcomings. Yes, that's true. That's true. I had a very interesting story when I was in Japan. I was uh, I was uh, accompanying a Nobel laureate, and they invited us to a to a school to talk about this and that and they showed us all sorts of things and it was a lot of fun they did presentations for us and then they said okay now there are like six people in total now all of you come up uh, on stage and say something smart about these things that you heard and you know the Nobel laureate was first then the second most important at the time I was the least important person so I go on like six then you know, they said already everything smart that came to my mind as well. And then I went upstairs and then it occurred to me that I actually have something that no one else was thinking about. And I said that you said that you did this uh, interesting uh, exercise that you taught half of the pupils 
how to dance, and you did not teach the other half. And then you observe that those people who, so those kids who learned to dance, they became better in social relationships than those who did not learn to dance. And I said, I postulate that you will also find that they are better at mathematics. And they said, we have already observed that, but we did not dare to say because we don't see how is it possible that that correlation is not possible. I said, it is because mathematics is about relations. And if you are leading your partner, you are paying attention not to step on other guys, your partner not to step on other people and so on. That's about relation. This this kind of relations are the essence of mathematics, not of those things that you do in elementary calculations, but the real mathematics is about relationships. And it, obviously, I managed to, in the end, say something <laughs> really smart. But <laughs> but uh, you know, it is these things are not trivial, and mm -hmm. it is it is very useful to to start thinking about it that way. So if we get this whole stuff about AI right then we will be able to get rid of all the boring stuff and we can keep all the exciting, intuitive, social, emotional things in our life and our life can significantly improve. But if we do it the other way around, then we will, we will just end up not having anything interesting to do. Yes. Uh, thank you, Victor. Uh, here I see uh, a question coming from Ali Olgach. Ali says... Um, do you think self-awareness and intuition will be possible for the machines no. in the future? No, I think that uh, they will not, at least not along the lines of where we are going now. So it is like as if you are learning all the time how to ride the bicycle better and faster and smoother, and then you expect that one day you should also know how to swim. These are completely different things. If we go against, you know, that's why it was that tiny slice of our knowledge that was about what the computer can do. And the intuition is not based there. It is, it is in these other areas that is not covered. So that's why it is very important to, to delineate the, the facts from the beliefs. <laughs> so, you know, we will run this algorithm so fast that you will think that it was intuition. You can, possibly, but it will not make it intuition because that's not how intuition works. It is the response of you as a whole to the situation as a whole and he's not breaking it down to elements which are then uh, uh, like very quickly processed. This holistic nature is quintessential for intuition as well as all these other things that, that I uh, did not list now. So... So no, I am I am sure that this type of AI development will never lead to anything like intuition, and I am very glad that you uh, combined it with the question of consciousness because it also uh, is even less uh, concrete than intuition. Okay, so I hate that we have sometimes these people coming and uh, I mean from the AI world that they say that oh you know within five years we will be able to download the the consciousness into the computer actually the first time that i heard that was six years ago and uh, he said that it will be within five years so it's already proven wrong but the point is that we always so many people think about this as a computer question do we know the computer well enough it is not about the computer we already have the neuralink we know how to connect the computer to our uh, nervous system that's not the point, what it is that you want to download. We don't know, literally don't know what consciousness is. There are assumptions that, oh, maybe it's this some sort of harmonical, harmonious states of different parts of the brain. Maybe, but there is zero reason to assume that this is that. So self-consciousness or consciousness is a very, very tricky question. And, you know, it was... It was, what's his name, uh, David Chalmers, who, who defined the hard problem of consciousness. And that is all about that. Even if you could answer all those little questions that, that people were managing to ask, even that does not tell you anything about the purpose of consciousness, what it means, what it means that we understand the world, what it means to bring this understanding of what 
humanity is about to the table when you have a discussion. What it means to relate to other people. What is your place in the world? So these are these are all sorts of things that, you know, it is not not matter of of <laughs> firing a few neurons this or that way. Um, uh, uh, Victor, uh, let me uh, read a few um, uh, thank you statements to you. One comes from uh, Bilan Shahin. He says uh, it was really interesting and full of knowledge. Uh, thanks a lot to Mr. Dörfler. And then uh, Imit Şener wrote uh, in Turkish, he said that um, uh, your views are very um, uh, valuable, uh, especially the last uh, um, elabor uh, elaborations. Uh, and uh, he says, uh, thank you to, to you both. Um, now, uh, maybe there will be more questions. And then I want to elaborate a little bit more on uh, Ali Olgaç's uh, question. Uh, uh, you know, he talks about awareness and intuition. And uh, I remember uh, in one of your uh, papers, when you uh, talk about this uh, uh, Nobel laureates, uh, they said that uh, three things were important for us, uh, intuition, and uh, going from big picture to detail and detail to big picture. And the third was uh, these uh, hotspots. Now, hotspots you talked about, um, it's about uh, uh, master-apprenticeship relationship. Yes. It's a much uh, stronger uh, version of it. But the thing uh, going from big picture to detail and detail to big picture is this a uh, holistic approach, and I think yes. it really is uh, related to uh, to Ali's question. It's it's something to do with uh, awareness of the total, yes. and this is something we are able to do. And the machines uh, will probably not be able to do it for for quite some time, if if ever. I, I would say the ever is the the <laughs> the real scenario. <laughs> no, this is this is all about intuition. So if you understand the vaulting, then what it means that you can go from the vaulting to the detail, because that's not new, okay? So many people said that before, that being a grandmaster, so being knowledgeable of something means that you understand the big picture. But it is not only the big picture, and that was for me the, the big thing to learn from the Nobel laureates, but also the small detail. Why? Because they say, here is the big picture. I want the big picture to change in a particular way, and I can achieve that by tweaking this little component, and then the world changes. Now that's when you understand the whole thing. And that's that's hopelessly non algorithmic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is like you know, if if uh, the concept of the ladies' man, and uh, there are many jokes about how, for example, that person behaves, and when someone who is not talented for that tries to copy and Everything is done exactly the same way, but it always comes out wrong because the, the person who is good at it knows by intuition what makes the various people tick. And that's that's how it works. So, you know, uh, I uh, I had difficulties publishing this, this uh, Nobel laureate paper uh, for uh, various reasons, but one of them was that I declared that the I mean my co-author and I declared that the research method explicitly includes my intuition. I could not even conduct the interviews uh, without that. I mean it's not not trivial to enter into the room with a with a Nobel laureate. And so and I remember when the lady who was transcribing the interviews, she told me once, oh I see you particularly like this guy. I said, no, I actually particularly did not like that guy. So, and then I started thinking that, yes, uh, uh, he was suffering of an impostor syndrome. Okay. So he was not sure of himself, which for a Nobel laureate is a, is a very weird thing. But for that reason, the only way for him to feel comfortable, if he felt that he's liked. So I intuitively, I never thought this through. I intuitively responded to that, and I liked him for the duration of the interview. But actually, he was not that special, so I I did not did not like him that much. But that's how it comes across, and yes, that's correct. It was happening that way when we were analyzing the data. We had all these uh, uh, recordings and transcripts and all that stuff. My co-author did not read uh, any of the text. He started to interview me about how I changed in this process. So he had two times six hour long interviews with me, trying to trying to unpack what is it that I now see differently than before. So 
after all this stuff that I have, uh, you have learned, what do you think, what is the main difference between the highest level of knowledge and the second highest level of knowledge? Why do you think that someone is a grandmaster, is not a grandmaster? All these sorts of things. And I, I was responding sometimes even with answers that surprised me because that was the essence of this very long interview that I just drop out all those intuitive things. Then we can unpack that later. But, you know, the I, I would go so far after these Nobel laureate interviews that not a single great invention or, or scientific discovery ever happened by any other way than through intuition. I think that even, even we who study intuition and who love intuition, even we un underestimate how, how significant it is. We could not survive for a day if we did not have intuition. Uh, Victor, it's a very important statement you made. You said that there is no scientific uh, discovery which is possible uh, yeah, yeah. without intuition. Now, um, uh, but when we look at university education, uh, <laughs> we don't see uh, uh, many universities which is offering course on intuition. Uh, wh why, uh, you know, we are um, years after years in this, uh, 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 you know, in this uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, environment. Uh, what, what do you think the, the major bottlenecks are, uh, you know, for, for often a uh, course of uh, intuition in the universities? Well, I tend, don't tell my bosses, but I sneak it into the classroom. Uh, there is a class called knowledge management uh, or knowledge and innovation management. And of course, intuition is an important aspect of knowledge. So I talk a lot about intuition. But what I would really like is to have a course dedicated to intuition and also a practical course. I could not do that. It is not my area. But for example, I had a doctoral student who can deliver a practical course and can, can directly help uh, people improve their intuition. She did that with me as well. So it is, and you know, I was intuitive all my life or since I can remember, but it was, you know, all, all natural to me. But, uh, but uh, with this kind of conscious effort i became even better at that so but but i mean getting that accepted in a program i don't think that there should be anything especially uh, managerial executive programs or or creativity program innovation programs that are not uh, don't have a course on intuition yes that's true that's true but also there should be things about uh, uh, social relationships if, you, if I can say one thing that decreased over the years in terms of our student quality is not about knowledge of facts or information or all that stuff. It is about social relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true. That's true. Uh, we are ignoring... And COVID the... did not help. Yes. Uh, we are ignoring the uh, important aspects uh, as, as yeah. we are saying. And uh, we one day... Uh, Hopefully, we are going to see uh, something better in our uh, university curriculums. Well, uh, there are a few of us who are working on that, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, well, uh, we have uh, um, uh, Suzy Diaz in Brazil. He started giving a, a course on uh, intuition. And yeah. um, uh, Marta is working with Nicole. Uh, uh, you know, uh, they have developed uh, a training package uh, for entrepreneurial uh, intuition. I hope that they will yeah. come up with a, uh, with a university course just to, uh, you know, enhance that idea. So um, th there are, uh, I think, some signs. And I, I think in personally that in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, you know, this uh, intuition thing is going to get more and more yes. Uh, yes. attention. Yes, uh, because uh, there is a huge number of uh, literature build up on that, and this uh, yeah, yeah. this is going to go uh, go someplace. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely, I agree. Uh, 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 Victor, um, uh, we took uh, a lot of your time, and um... that's right. I think that there is one more thing that we should do. Uh, once we uh, turn off the recording, or once you turn off the recording, we should also ask if someone has any questions that they did not want on record. Uh, repeat again. I didn't get that. Uh, we should ask. So once you turn off the recording, we yeah. should ask if anyone has any questions that they did not want to have recorded. Oh, okay. In that case, uh, I'm turning recording off now. Uh, let me finish this.
Um, kind of, okay.